Who are you? Where are we? And what do you do? Okay. Um, I am Sophie Khan. I am an Australian, British, and American. Uh, I used to call myself a digital artist, and now I just use the term artist. Um, we are in my studio at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts in Midtown Manhattan, and I make most of my work here, um, including 3D scanning, um, painting my sculptures, and uh, yeah, most of the studio practice happens in this space. What artists or groups are pushing the boundaries of art and design right now, and who are you following? I look at a lot of my contemporaries. I think there are some really wonderful um, number of female artists who work with technology and 3D in a way that's really fascinating to me. Claudia Hart is a long-term mentor and friend. Um, I love Sarah Ludi's work, Sabrina Ratte, but I also look at figurative painters. I look at Lucien Freud and Jenny Saville, um, Paula Rego, people who kind of handle the body in interesting ways. Um, and going a little further back, artists like Eva Hesse or Louise Bourgeois, um, really not all digital work, but people who explore the representation of the female body in uh, ways that are kind of challenging. What inspires you these days? So I am, right now I'm learning digital sculpting software. So I'm learning ZBrush and I'm learning ways to manipulate the body um, on a sort of individual basis and using brush tools. And I am really intrigued by the ways that we see manufactured female bodies in media. So right now I'm looking at like fitness transformation photos on Instagram mm -hmm. and I'm interested in, um, you know, the, the Kardashians and the, the underlayer of manipulation that happens to the body in all the imagery of women that we consume. And I'm trying to think about how to feed that into my practice. What is next for your practice? So my work is becoming more and more, maybe not collaborative, I'm, I'm making more portraits. So I'm working on a series right now where I put out a call for models who felt that they had been through some form of physical transformation recently. So one of my models had found out she was a carrier for the BRCA gene and had a preventative mastectomy. Um, one of my models was seven months pregnant with twins. One had had weight loss surgery and had actually come to me originally as a, in my commercial business and had me scan her every time she lost a certain amount of weight. Um, so I have just worked with a model who's an eating disorder survivor and so is interested in how her body is transformed. And together we've actually been developing a kind of pose library um, based on their experiences and their embodiment. As they, as they view themselves. And I'm bringing in skin tone for the first time, which is really exciting for me. Um, I decided it was really problematic that the, the scanner material, the 3D print material is a default white, and I wanted more of the identity of my subjects to come through. I felt like the, the process was erasing it. And so I'm restoring skin tone with paint. I'm doing inkjet transfers. Um, I photographed all their tattoos and I'm texture mapping their tattoos back onto the sculpture. So the work is really, it's nice because it's become much more, much less kind of solipsistic, navel gazing, self-portraiture and a little more about conversations with other people who come into the studio and we sit and talk about being a woman and being in a female body and what their experiences has been. Um, and then create a work that kind of comes out of those conversations. What does it mean to you to work with other people's body? It's, it's really interesting. Um, and it's something that I'm enormously sensitive to in terms of, you know, I have a model release that they sign that says I can do anything I want with the data, but it's been very important to me to consult and to give them a veto power, um, particularly for people who have concerns about their bodies or um, kind of feel that they have a fraught relationship with their appearance. Um, but it's, it's also been really interesting to work with, to hire and to, to um, 
work with performers. So for my last series, I worked with a group of Bouteau performers during a residency at Pioneer Works. And one of the models, Azumi, who I worked with numerous times, said that when she is on the stage, she's she was trained to always think about the angles. She said, I'm always thinking about angles. So because you're performing in the round, your body might look one way from one side and one way from another, and that she wants it to be a visually rewarding experience to see her pose from every single direction. And so that's incredible for me as a sculptor, and actually as a sculptor who trained as a photographer and still tra is trying to force myself to not think in 2D, that she's thinking about herself in 3D. And so she's developing a movement kind of library or choreography that works in the round. Um, so people have brought in many, many things that I could not have directed them. It's been the really exciting surprise of these, these new projects. You were one of the first artists to work with 3D scanning and 3D modeling. What motivated you to take that risk and start experimenting? I trained in photography. Um, I started to find photography somewhat limiting and I became interested in 3D modeling because you could transform the material of your object. And in a 3D program, you can place a virtual camera and virtual lights and you can make photographs from a vantage point that a human body could not practically occupy. Um, so I learned these tools and then I was studying at a lab in Melbourne, Australia, the Spatial Information Architecture Lab. And the director was the lead architect on the restoration of Gaudi's Sagrada Familia Cathedral. And they were using 3D scanners and 3D printers. They were scanning Gaudi's original maquettes, reverse engineering to get the data from these models and then trying to visualize um, how he'd actually wanted the cathedral to be finished. And so I just was drawn by instinct to this device. And I asked the technician, what happens if you do this wrong? And he looks at me, he's like, oh, it's gross. It's just these chunks floating in space. It's like these weird glitches. And I just, my eyes kind of lit up and I'm like, I want to see it. I want to see the, the weird chunks floating in space. Um, but my practice, I was really not that interested in architecture as a photographer. I was always interested in the human body. And so it only made sense to scan my body and to scan the face. And then I wanted to materialize that because I was interested in all the gaps and the errors in the scanning process. And the easiest way to see that is to materialize the data in three dimensions and to walk around it and to encounter it as an art object in the physical world. So it was a very natural progression and one thing kind of called me on to the next thing. Where do you see opportunities for subversion and reimagining in current tech trends? I think it's hard. I think that a lot of technology is designed with quite rigid underlying assumptions and not every artist is a hacker. Um, we're not all people who are kind of taking apart tools. That said, artists have a long tradition of not accepting the status quo and of bending tools to their needs. And I think that there are many really interesting things being done um, within 3D and within fabrication that challenge the technology itself rather than serve as a kind of tech demo for, for these companies. Um, one thing that I was really interested to come across recently was the trend of 3D makeup on Instagram where people map um, virtual makeup that's dimensional, three-dimensional, but, you know, not physically present, and it's mapped onto the face and it moves with the wearer's face. So this really bizarre reimagining of, like, virtual beauty and what that could be. History and the history of different medias is important to you. How do you decide on a line of inquiry? I mean, I have a dual degree, an undergrad degree in art history, and I spend a lot of time studying photography theory. And I'm always trying to find little echoes of the ideas that I'm thinking about in past media histories. And so I just wrapped up a kind of almost a two-year body of work investigating hysteria 
And what fascinated me about that history was the way that photography was used in the asylums and the photography was used in this very violent transaction to capture the largely female, not exclusively, but the largely female patients. And then there was kind of a sense in which they resisted the camera's gaze and their bodies were kind of unstable. And it was a violent transaction, but also possibly a performance that they were complicit in for their survival. And so that to me echoed a whole lot of really interesting thinking, contemporary thinking about technology capturing our body. Um, so I'm always looking for these kind of nuggets um, that speak to things that we're still considering today. What was the impetus and thoughts behind founding Lady Tech Guild? Um, yeah, so the Lady Tech Guild is an all-female collective of artists, designers, educators, um, entrepreneurs who are working around the 3D industry in one way or another. Um, we host a meetup group in New York City. We have several hundred members. We have monthly events and we do programming. Um, we have a Slack channel and uh, we just aim to be a general resource for um, women, but anybody who identifies as female who is starting out in this world and maybe they're looking for tech support with Autodesk rendering products or maybe they need a connection for a freelance 3D modeling job. Um, we try to span industries and share resources because that doesn't always happen. Um, the Lady Tech Guild actually came out of a residency that was sponsored by the 3D printing company Shapeways at the Museum of Arts and Design. There was a digital fabrication show called Out of Hand and Lauren Slawick is one of our, my co-founders and Ashley Zielinski, who's been also involved with Code Futures. Um, well, so Lauren was on site with Shapeways at the exhibition and Ashley and I were both artists in residence at different times. And we just connecting with Lauren first of all and then Ashley was amazing because we had all been self-taught. We'd all really had to figure out these tools on our own and had this experience of just, you know, sitting at your laptop, banging your head against a wall, trying to solve some stupid technical problem for days. And it was quite isolating. And we would, I would go on meetup.com and I would look for, you know, New York 3D printing meetup and it would just be a sea of dudes. The photos, you know, it would be 50 male faces and you don't always want to be the only one of whatever you are in a room. Um, you you want to network and share tips and resources without having to always expend that energy and not that we shouldn't fight for it but sometimes you just don't want to um so we formed the group we just wanted to keep talking connecting with both of those women was really fantastic because we had so much in common and i hung out at mad for a week chatting with lauren and then just decided we wanted to keep the conversation going. And we realized there must be many, many other people in our shoes who were trying to learn, trying to sort of make their way in this world, either as an artist or in a commercial context. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we could pool our networks and our resources? And so that became the Lady Tech Guild group. What are some of the lessons or takeaways or inspiring moments from being a part of Lady Tech Guild? Um, just that sharing resources is, is really powerful and that each artist or um, each individual tends to sometimes end up in a little silo and might not know who to contact if they need a specific thing made or they might... Um, not know you know how to solve some particular challenging technical issue in their software and the larger you can the larger a net you can spread the more likely you're going to find somebody who could help you with that issue help you find a job um, or just kind of you know geek out and talk shop and talk about rhino for an hour in a bar you know like that's hard to find how is the digital body a site of resistance for you? That's a really interesting question. Um, there is, there's a manifesto re written quite recently um, by a 
writer uh, named Legacy Russell and um, it was called Glitch Feminism and I would probably not do it justice by attempting to sum it up, so I'd recommend that people read it. Um, but in brief, she talks about the glitch as a sign of resistance because um, the way that I think of it, you know, technologies are sold to us with this promise of being omnipotent and, and all-seeing and, you know, wars are fought on data that comes from laser scan planes flying over the Middle East and um, there's there's sort of a trust that's placed in it and but you know the female body is captured circulated sold distributed um, both in two and increasingly in three dimensions and commodified and if you can insert a glitch in that transmission um, somehow if you can and this was the title of the talk that we did at CoFutures a couple months ago. It was called Resist Perfect Transmission. Um, there's a way in which you are evading that gaze or, you know, the body becomes something, it's the ghost in the machine that is, there's an element of it that remains uncapturable and undefinable and therefore may be more difficult to circulate and commodify. So that's how I consider the glitch. It's It's that element of friction that comes in between, you know, the two ends of the transaction of representation. What are you excited about with more artists becoming involved with digital tools? Um, yeah, I am really interested in artists who use all these technologies and don't really call themselves digital artists, who see it as one step in a very kind of multi-layered and maybe multivalent workflow. So even when I noticed when I was teaching at Pratt five or six years ago, um, I was teaching a class called 3D Modeling for Artists and we had students who might make a Maya render, turn that into a, a screen print screen, transfer it, you know, onto mulberry paper and then the end result would be a really beautiful screen print or they might design a virtual installation in Maya but then make sort of low-res inkjet prints on cardboard and then build it for real in cardboard. So I'm really interested in much more of a fluidity happening between the digital and the analog, between the kind of embodied and disembodied and um, I'm less interested in work just from my own point of view that's born digital or work that's screen-based or interactive and I'm more interested in work that bleeds into the physical embodied world but maybe then bleeds back out again um, and doesn't kind of define itself as, as purely digital or not. And I think we're seeing so much more work within the art world and apparently the fairs this year. Um, so many more artists who kind of embrace that, that fluidity and don't define themselves quite so much. So I'm going to say a couple words, and if you could just respond with whatever comes to the top of your head. First word, mistake. So I really try to embrace mistakes in my work, and it's one reason that I don't bring fabricators in until the end of the process, because there are so many amazing things that can go wrong, and a fabricator with the best of intentions would probably throw that in the trash. And I love to keep a record of errors that pop up and um, material errors, digital errors. I have a folder full of, that's called just like weird errors that happened. And I always encourage my students to save those as well. So I think you need a level of flexibility to remain open to those mistakes. But almost every interesting discovery that I've made in my work has been the result of a mistake at some point. The second word is limit. Again, I think that it's a really interesting exercise in technology to use something at the limit of what it was designed to do. Um, like the scanner that I use is really not designed to capture the human body and scanning a body kind of pushes at its limits. And so when you find the limit of something, you find the assumption that was made beneath its design. And if you can kind of force a situation 
where something is performing beyond its limit, that's sometimes where the really interesting work happens. Body. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> um, I was scanning a, a model today and I was talking about, I recommended she read this, read this poem called The Heavy Bear, um, which was also, I think, the name of a series of essays about the body. And it talks about our physical bodies as these kind of encumbrances. It's like this lumbering stupid bear that follows you around that you've got to feed and water and take care of. Um, and sometimes it's just incredibly frustrating. You feel like you spend all your time just dealing with the body and can't actually, you know, <laughs> go beyond it. But of course, we you can't, you know, that's, that's where we are. We're nothing beyond our bodies. Artistic intimacy. Oh... Um, that's, that's a tricky one because it's, you know, I've only just started to let collaboration into my work. I typically don't collaborate. Um, I have in the past, but I tend to, I get very sort of nitpicky and perfectionist and sometimes I don't want to inflict that on anybody else. <laughs> and sometimes I think some of the success that I've had in my work has only been because I put up just with ridiculous BS that nobody else would, would really stand for or have the patience to deal with. Um, but it has been really gratifying to have bring models into the conversation. Um, and there's, again, when you're scanning someone, you know, particularly like a nude model in the studio, there really is a level of trust that they have and a kind of artistic exchange. Um, so that's that's interesting and that's an energy that I want to bring into the work more.